So there's chaos in the middle of Ramirez Arellano and people are like running towards my mom and my brother. And the person behind my mom's car, like runs, gets my brother, take them, take them to my home. And my dad ends up taking my brother to the hospital. The woman that saved my brother is a woman renting me the apartment. And my mom and her hadn't spoken for 25 years. Wow. <laughs> so when this happens, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Miami. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 79 of the Miami Tech Pod. I'm Caesar, joined by Maria and our special guest this week, Beatriz Ayala, the founder and CEO of Musicasa, aka Bea, as she goes by uh, in, in Miami circles. Bea, welcome to the Miami Tech Pod. Thank you. Happy Friday. I feel like this, this has been a year in the making. I am very excited to be here with you all today. You have, I feel like you've been the most talked about guest that hasn't been a guest yet. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, we should jump right into why. Well, I mean, we like can, this, this... I mean there's many reasons why, but. <laughs> oh my God, I am nervous. Maybe we can get like a Guinness World Record on being mentioned, but not necessarily being an interviewee. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, he, he, here's the deal for, for the listeners. Um, we've covered this in previous episodes, but if you're new to this podcast, like this is an all time Miami tech story here. Um, we discovered that Maria and Bea are cousins through a tech event. Maria, do you want to tell the listeners how that went? <laughs> well, I, so backtrack into like when I first met Bea, I was actually via zoom. It was the middle of the pandemic, a mutual <laughs> friend, Marie Barry had connected us. Uh, we had a great conversation. And then when things started to open up and we, you know, we started to hang out, we were at a Miami Tech barbecue that Demian and Jenny had organized. And, you know, I took a picture of us, me and Bea with the chefs of the day. And then, uh, which by the way, highly recommend drinking pig barbecue. Um, shout out to them. It was the most delicious barbecue I think I've had in Miami. Um, but we, I posted this picture. My mom calls me like an hour later and she's like, what are you doing hanging out with your cousin? And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, huh? And she's like, the picture you just posted. I'm like, no, I was with like Bea. And she's like, that's your cousin. And you know, Puerto Rico is a small place. So, and, and her argument was always like, yeah, like she always made it seem like everybody was connected. And I was like, no, they're not. And so this only fuels her argument that like, we're all family. <laughs> um, so I don't think we've had Javi on, on the show either, but he's every from Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rican, every Puerto Rican is related. <laughs> well, well, that apparently, so apparently Javi and I are also cousins. And we just found out like two months ago. But here's the thing. Well, like, he called me and he was like, I just did 23 and me. Um, he's like, can we see if we're cousins? I'm oh, like, sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, like, of that course. That would be epic. That would be but then he must family. be your cousin on another side then? Because then so, Javi and I are not related. So my entire family, well, no, because you and I are related through our moms and- Here we go. This is, this is the Miami, like the ultimate icebreaker well, for conversations. The Miami, how are, little, how's everyone related? Well, with the Miami with a little bit of sea salt from Puerto Rico, but my family, my mom's family side is from the West Coast, from a little town called San Sebastián del Pepino, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of the mountains in Puerto Rico, super tiny. And apparently Maria's mom and my mom were raised together where my grandmother and my mom were born in San Sebastián growing up. And everyone on the west side extending extending to Mayagüez, which is where Javi's from, is our family because part of our family moved to Mayagüez. So, and that's where all these symbioses and the things start happening. <laughs> Amazing. All right. So that was all-time story. I mean, I, I was just blown away that in the middle, and this was like at the early stages of like Miami tech explosion and everyone is like really networking and people are starting companies and all of that. And, um, it was really neat to hear that story. Um, but Bea, you are the founder and CEO of like one of the coolest companies in Miami, Musicasa. Thank you. Do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about Musicasa? Because I mean, what a good idea, what an incredible company, but like, you know, they should hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, Musicasa has been almost three years in the making, which is crazy to think looking back because it feels like it's been a long time, but it, it also feels that like it's been a very short period of time, especially living through it in a pandemic and so on. 
But yes, I'm Bea, founder and CEO of Musicasa. We are building the largest venue network in the world by transforming homes into entertainment venues. And the way that we do that is that we pay homeowners and renters to host independent emerging untapped artists in their homes via home concerts. And the whole idea here is to give more access, better exposure and more amplification to these artists through the arts and really give people the chance to become curators and promoters of culture and, and the arts. And it's no secret that venues have been closing a, by the minute since the pandemic. And there's not really spaces where these types of artists, specifically 91% of them, um, have the ability to perform. And I just figured why not in the home where the culture and home co human connection already happens and what happens when you extend that to your network and your network's networks and people come together to experience something pretty magical. And, and that's sort of like the very short summary of what it is that we're building. I have been lucky enough to attend many of these and I have to say it's, it's quite the experience. I think one thing is hearing about it and another thing is experiencing it. It's just like a whole other level. So highly recommend people to do that. And I feel like I want to get into your entrepreneurial journey, but before that, I feel like there's tons of questions that come up when you kind of, when we talk about Musicasa, I kind of want to clarify some things that I'm sure people immediately are, are wondering, like, you know, what's required? Like who, is it random people? Is it not? Is it, do you have yeah. to serve like a little bit of that for anyone who might kind of be interested in kind of hosting one? Absolutely. I love these questions um, specifically because people think it's way harder than what it is. And we're tapping into a social behavior that already happens. Um, more than 52% of the American population hosts from their homes. And on average, they do it seven times a year, right? So this is not something that we're trying to create new. We're tapping into existing behavior of people, people inviting guests into their home. However, people are spending tons of money, specifically $1,400 a year and spending a lot of time planning these things. And where we come in is simplifying some of those aspects and some of those negotiations specifically with musicians so that you can, you can have it in a way that feels a little bit more cultural and a more sophisticated, if you will, or more exclusive. So the interesting part about Musicasa is that we're building the first peer-to-peer -peer platform where we're actually bringing in these dis connections through data. And it's the first sort of like tech platform being built for the live entertainment sector where you're removing sort of like the promoter and you're removing the producers and you're bringing in, like you're connecting people to people to make it happen. So the cool thing is that when you think about the flywheel of Musicasa, the driver of the business is really the host because we need a venue for these musicians to be able to perform. So the host has the entire uh, freedom and calling of the shots on how their Musicasa happens. So as a host, you choose your date and time, you choose your genre selection, you decide if it's private or if it's public, you decide if you pay for the experience as a host or if you charge guests and sell virtual tickets. And then when you hit a minimum, you start making money. So when we explain Musicasa, it, the best way for us to do so is like, think of Tiny Desk meets Airbnb hosting. And we're bringing those two worlds together and really celebrating and enabling and, and allowing for community created experiences to grow. Um, and it, it's, it's a beautiful way to give people the chance to curate things in ways that they had, they never thought they could. And so kind of what, tell, tell us a little bit about the journey and what made you, what got you to kind of arrive at Musicasa and launch it? And yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, Musicasa was never meant to be a company and it was never meant to be a tech company specifically. I spent 11 years in advertising and marketing. I worked in some of the biggest agencies in the world. I had the opportunity to work with some incredible brands ranging from beauty brands from Procter & Gamble to sneakers, M&Ms, Pepsi, Bacardi, all throughout the U.S. Hispanic market, Central America and the Caribbean. And my, my goal back then was I'm going to be the gen, like, general manager of one of these agencies and then I'm going global. And then Hurricane Maria happened and then I had a massive emotional burnout and I realized that I didn't want to be a general manager of any advertising agency. <laughs> and I quit. I sold everything that I owned and I went to travel the world. And when I traveled the world, I realized that I realized I, 
remembered something that I knew already, but I had completely forgotten, which is the smaller the spaces and the gatherings amongst people, specifically people that you don't know, the more impact and the more opportunities actually happen within those spaces and within those conversations. Because one, you're talking about things that you don't tend to talk about in big crowds. Two, you're really allowing for people to tell their story from their vantage point. And three, there's always food and music in the table. And it doesn't really matter what the conversation is about. You get to learn about people through their culture and their music and their food. And I grew up in a home like this. I grew up in a home where my parents were hosts and never monetized as un centavo of everything that they did, right? So they hosted weddings, they hosted quinceañeros. We had this famous party called El Party del Reciclaje, which every 1st of January we would do and people would bring all the stuff that was extra from the New Year's Eve party in their homes. And we will create this like home block party that my parents hosted. That's and amazing. here you have people that you had never seen and you would never see again in your life, but they were part of that memory. So when I came back from traveling the world, I moved to Palo Alto and I knew that I wanted to build something. I just didn't know what. And a couple months after moving, I was really struggling. Um, like, By the really way, is, is that code for I went to Stanford? No, no. I'm actually at Stanford now doing a program, but no, I, it was a very, I had, I was making no money. My parents were like, what the, can I curse here? What, what the fuck? Yeah, what, the no, fuck? what the fuck are you doing in Palo Alto? You don't, no one, there's no one there. It's the most expensive city, probably one of the most expensive cities in the U S. And they were probably the only people that called it Palo Alto. Not Palo Alto. <laughs> That's, thank you. Yes. Um, I was living with three French 21 year olds that were building a startup in their space. Um, I just knew that I needed to be there. It was this like instinct. I had no data, factual data proving that I needed to be there. I just felt it. And I took the chance and it took me four months after getting there to realize that it wasn't looking pretty and that I was, I felt ashamed and guilty because I didn't want to, I didn't want to ask my parents for help because they had told me four months ago, like, what are you doing? So one of my advisors was like, here's a financial coach that works with high-performing individuals. Why don't you talk to her and see like, and she helps people build companies, like talk to her. So I did, and I spent all the money I had left on her and to, I called my brother to, so that he could help me pay my rent next month. The, the following month and I had two weeks left of food and I got to work with this woman and two weeks later Musicasa was born and it was like this I have it here actually it's like a tiny notebook where in two hours I had the entire business plan for the company and here we are almost three years later what what, what an incredible story um so you know these types of companies, when they're like literally built from scratch, you know, and you were just like, you took it from that you know, the piece of paper, the in, you know, like the words in the notebook to your first couple of concerts. Walk us through those those moments, right? Because <laughs> oh I, I feel like those are always the scrappiest. Those are always the best stories. So it's like, you know, that we we had um, Stephen Galanis, the the founder and CEO of Cameo, and he he was walking us through on on the podcast, and he was walking us through like the first day they launched, it was a complete shit show, right? Like, <laughs> you know, he, was, he had like, uh, you know, this like NFL player to, to do the first cameo and they were expecting like traffic everywhere all over the country and like two people. They're all staring at the screen and there's so, like nothing. <laughs> I, I, I sense there's a Musicasa version of that because every great startup, you know, has the struggles, but why, why don't you walk us through that? You know, I think that I, that's an interesting topic to discuss after I tell this story, because I think we, it's important that we talk about movements and how you really create um, a movement. So people are, people are part of your brand, but also your story. Um, so we'll go back to that because I have many thoughts on, on that topic specifically, but my journey. So I write this, it's a Monday, seven o'clock at night in Palo Alto. I was doing a digital, digital detox and a food detox. So I had already eaten. And I couldn't be in my tech <laughs> like things. Because was the I, food detox just because you were running out of money and you're like, I might as well just do a food detox. I won, I won a detox. So I was like, I might as well do it. <laughs> I might as well do it and eat well. And the digital detox was like, you couldn't use your, your technology platforms after 6 p.m. 
every night that week. So I was like, okay, I might as well journal. I start journaling. I end up writing this business plan. I put it into a Google doc and I had already access to the music industry because in my, in my advertising years, the majority of my campaigns were music focused. Like I got to produce music with Grammy winning artists and Latin Grammy winning, winning artists. And I got to produce a lot of campaigns that were music focus related. So I write the plan and I send it to two of my, my good friends from Puerto Rico in the music industry and they're reading it and they, they write me back and they're like, there's definitely something here. You need, you need to tackle this, like go for it. And I didn't even know where to start. So I, I take my, writing, I put it away. I'm like, I'm not going to deal with this right now. I was traveling to Philadelphia to do a panel on the importance of organizational culture, which is a topic I'm very passionate about, trying to build another thing before Musicasa. So I come back, it's October 8th. There's a Puerto Rican gathering in, in San Francisco um, for Hurricane Maria. And there's these two really big entrepreneurs from Puerto Rico that have made it, that have had exits. And I was like, this is my chance. So I started talking to them as if Musicasa had existed for many months and I had already done many concerts, which is not true. And in that, in that gathering, I met our first Musicasa host and I met a woman that used to do a party called Perreo por una causa, which is for our listeners, if you don't know what Perreo is, it's, what, it's the type of dance you do, do reggaeton. So if Bad Bunny's performing, you're gonna perrear to Bad Bunny, right? So she had the entire list of Latin musicians in the San Francisco Bay Area. So she's like, call me tomorrow, I'll start, I will give you a list. She spent two hours on the phone with me. She gave me more than 100 names. And Laura was like, I'll give you my home. We just moved. Like we have a music room that we don't use. We wanna do this. So that was October 8th. November 22nd was the first, was the first Musicasa concert. And it was a flyer that said $10 per person, 100% of the, of the sales are going to the musicians. Um, you have to bring your food and your alcohol. And it was 20 people. And I remember being in that concert, seeing it come to life. And I cried the entire concert. We have people from Cuba, India, from Russia. We have people from, of course, the U S Puerto Rico, um, just like this melting pot of cultures and backgrounds. And they were listening to boleros and bossa nova and Puerto Rican folkloric music with a cuatro. And I am in tears <laughs> because it's coming to life. And never in my, in, like in my biggest dreams that I think it, it was going to be that beautiful. And that was like, I remember that being a, a Friday in two weeks after that, I had raised $35,000 for friends and family to start this. And I was getting calls from people in Puerto Rico, like, why are you doing this in San Francisco and not in Puerto Rico? So between there and lockdown, we had done 24 musicasas in five countries or in five, in five cities, excuse me. So it was, it, it was, yeah, it was extraordinary. And it wasn't an epic fail to the, in comparison to the cameo, it was like a proof that there was something here. I just didn't know what to, how to do, how to go about it. So then you launch your company, which is all about bringing people into your homes and then lockdown, like COVID, <laughs> not the best timing. What happened? So I was in Puerto Rico visiting family. Um, so I had this like, little, I had this tiny like luggage with the clothes that I was going to wear in Puerto Rico for the next two weeks. And then I was going back home to the Bay area. Well, that didn't happen. I remember them announcing the lockdown and less than 24 hours, I announced that we're going virtual. I had no idea how we were gonna do it. I had no confirmation from artists that they were willing to do this. So I'm announcing on the on the social media platforms that we're, that we're going virtual while I'm talking to musicians, like confirming that they're in. And I knew that if I started with this particular musician in Puerto Rico called Andrea Cruz, that the rest was gonna be history because everyone trusts her. But she had told me no twice already for the original Musicasa. So I, took, I take the chance, I call her, and I'm like, listen, this is gonna be for the next three weeks. Why don't we do this? Let's do it virtual. She was like, in, I'm in. So we were actually the first company in the world, and take that with a grain of salt, because I don't know the local news in many places, that were able to monetize live streamings. And no one knows about it because we were this like small, tiny company in working in the middle of Puerto Rico. And I remember announcing that it was Andrea Cruz for the first virtual Musicasa using Zoom as a platform, not knowing if the sound was gonna work properly because each musician was in their home. I was hosting from my home and everyone else attending was in their homes. 
and it sold out in less than four hours. People paying wow. to attend. And then I thought, okay, we're going to do this like three times a week. In the first 30 days of COVID, we did 47 musicasas, 100% of them sold out, paying musicians oh. above 100. Oh, yeah. And it was like, it was, it, it was insane. But, I was well, more tired <laughs> than probably <laughs> I was today. Wow. Amazing. Let, let's talk a little bit about the musician side of the marketplace, right? Because I, I feel like yeah. this is super interesting. Um, from, from my vantage point, you're giving musicians this incredible platform and distribution uh, mechanism for their music in a world that's like highly competitive. You know, there's a ton of gatekeepers pre-internet um, around the, the you know, whether musicians make it or not, right? Um, you hear every, almost every founding story of a band is like, we lived in a car <laughs> uh, and, and we struggled and we were going to shows and there was 15 people. Um, but this in a way, almost like right sizes that journey and like propels some of these uh, musicians forward um, in, in an incredible way because there's this like, I, I think this amazing like, you know, feeling when you're like discovering new artists and it's compounded when it's either in your home or in a friend's home, right? Like, can, can you talk a little bit about the impact you've had on, on the mus musician side of, of the business? Yes. And that's, pro that's potentially uh, the side that makes me the, makes me the most emotional. Um, because first of all, you're working with musicians that don't trust anyone. And they don't trust anyone because they've been taken advantage of over and over and over again. So you, you, there's a level of intimacy and relationship that you kind of like have to build with them early on so that when things go really well, they're really happy. And when things don't go as planned, they're understanding and they have grace with you because you're doing something that hasn't been done before. So one of the things that I did at the beginning when it was just me I remember I had more than 250 conversations with artists and they have my number and I know them by name and last name. And I know what their situation is. Uh, if, if they have two, three jobs and they're a musician, if they quit everything and they're just a musician, like it's, it's pretty incredible when they start one, when they start trusting you Two, when you take a step back and you look at the music industry, distribution, uh, distribution, labels, touring, merchandising, and everything that comes, streaming, and everything that comes with it. Um, they're not really thought out for the many to be discovered and the many to see the fruits of the labor. Um, they're, they're done in a way that really celebrates and exacerbates people that are already famous. And when you look at the music industry from a percentage perspective, and there's a 100%, one like 0 0.01 percent of that are mega star are mega stars like J Lo's and the Madonnas of the world. Then you have like 1.6 that are mainstream artists. Think Mark Anthony. Think um, Ricky Martin. And then you have development artists. And then the rest at that 91 percent, it's more than 10 million musicians around the world will never be discovered. They haven't been discovered since 2014. That statistic hasn't changed. So. The YouTubes of the world, the Spotify's of the world, yes, they, they're a platform that provides more distribution and more eyeballs. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to live from them. If you're like, you need to be a content creator, and musicians are not content creators; they're musicians. So you need to give them the one thing that they're lacking, which is community, because community is the way that they get they get discovered, they get exposure, and they they they're able to monetize. And it's way easier to monetize a community when you start when you're having the ability to connect with them in an intimate way in, a, in real life versus behind a screen on social media where people are just scrolling. So for us, it's really important to keep the Musicasas between 15 to 40 people to allow for that rapport and allow for those stories to emerge and allow for that connection to happen, but also really instructing the musicians their side of the work. Because it's not like you come to a Musicasa and that's it. It's like, did you create an email list? What are you gonna do with that email list later? How are you going to re-engage them when you launch a new song? Like, how are you preparing yourself to ensure that they keep following your journey and you keep them in tune to what you're doing? And many of these musicians don't know how to do that. And 
we've been that for them. We've been like, we, I feel like we're this like kind of like big sister, big brother where we're, we're teaching you how to create a brand for yourself. And last thought is that touring is the most, it's the best source of income for artists, but it's extremely expensive. And you, not every artist has the capacity to perform at venues, either because they're the gatekeepers that they don't trust that you could sell something or because they don't allow for covers or they don't allow for you for um, performing your originals, right? Because they don't know you, you don't have an audience. So what Musicasa changes is that it doesn't matter you don't have an audience, we're tapping into the host network to create an audience for you. And that's why it's so important having this three-way sort of like support where you have the host, the fans and the artist working together to create this, this like reds, reds eh, or networks of communities where they can all all feed from each other. That, that that part is incredible to me because I mean, like that that's a real disruption, right? In live music, um, I'm thinking as you were talking about that, like it's not if I, before music guys, if I wanted to just like have a live performer at my home, it's it's like not easy, right? Like I have to like either word of mouth, you know, search the internet, all of that you pick up the phone and because of this, like, well, is it worth it to us? We'd rather play at the venue that's for sure going to pay us X. And we know like, it's, you know, a lot more um, straightforward or whatever. There's like less risk involved. You know, we'll, we'll just do that. This is like an exciting kind of development where as a host, you could browse like all sorts of different music. You can like have different artists every other you know time. Like, that, that that part is is super neat to me. Can can you talk about you know like the host side of the business and whether um, you know like just cool stories of like awesome venues and repeat hosts yeah. or power hosts and all that? Because I, I feel like there's a lot of pride on the host side as well. Of like you know like our, our mutual friend Natalia is like one who's like a power host. She's always have um, like a, a bunch of these concerts at her home and people kind of like are there not just because of her as a host and her cool loft and all of that, but also, you know, because it's like a different musician every time. So it, Mira, it's a really interesting first, it's a, it's a really amazing opportunity for artists because if, if they're performing live, they're performing live at restaurants or corporate events or weddings, which are not really created for live performances. That's one. And two, when they perform, they tend to perform really late at night. So they're getting in their, up to their homes like at 2, 3, 4 in the morning versus Musicasa, they do everything before 10 p.m. If you want to do a, two, a second and a third gig that night after Musicasa, go ahead and do it. But we're making sure that we're also keeping it in a way that's, that's safe, that's in for connection, and we follow the city ordinances of, of, of noise regulations. But from the whole side, I had this false assumption going into this that people were going to host because they just felt like hosting, like they out of love, like they wanted to like build community and they, they weren't really into it for the money. The money was going to be like this extra cherry on top. But what, what we've discovered is that people, the driver might not be the money, but they want the money. Right. So it's like, yeah, yeah, it's not really about the money, but how much am I getting paid? So we have these two types of hosts. One we call the party in a box. This is a typical host that does it once or twice a year. They pay for the experience. It's private. It's only for friends and family. And the second, the second tier of hosts, we call it the gig host, which is the person that does it because they want to diversify their income stream. They want to entertain from their home and they want to connect with their existing community or they want to expand their network. And that's 80% of our business, gig hosts, people that do it because of those reasons. Now, specifically to talk about stories of different hosts, what we've discovered is that people are also becoming fans of hosts. So they, they won't go to another Musicasa except if that host is hosting, which is really interesting. Why? Because then they trust how the person is curating. They trust what the person the person's choosing. They love the people that they're meeting within that space. And an example of this is Natalia. You were just mentioning her. She's a super host. She's hosted. 22 times in 16 months she like it, it, like she she it's easy for her like this is something that she loves to do 
She has the power of convening people. She is already she was already within the arts and culture and technology ecosystems here in Miami. So for her, it has helped that she already had this sort of like community created from her years of just being part of the Miami, Miami, Miami sphere. But we have other new ones. Like we have a couple from Fort Lauderdale. They joined in May and they've hosted every month since. And two of the months they've hosted twice a month. And they're, they're just like, I want my home to be a venue. Like I want musicians to be in my home. I want to have access to this type of connection and culture component. And they've hosted everything from pop and folk to blues, funk, world jazz, like indie, and people are going here and they're like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting this because people are like, yeah, we're going to just go see a band and it's going to be okay. And then they're like, why is this $35? I want to pay more. And two, where do you find these musicians? Because they are extraordinary. And there's just a lot of talent out there. And the hosts, the ones that are really sort of like into it, they're like, oh shit, I can do this many times and I can make a lot of money. And you can make up to, so the way that Musicasa works is that if you're selling virtual tickets based on the capacity of your home, you have to sell a minimum to cover the cost of the artist in the Musicasa platform. But anything after that goes to you. And you can be making up to $300, $400 for the hour of hosting. Just from So the platform. host sets the price. Uh, they have to cover the cost for the, you know, the... So, yeah, so right now we do because we want to be make sure that we are within market ranges and that it's not like we don't want a home charging $100 a piece uh, yet. Um, but we do want people to pay what, what it's worth paying without knowing the artist, without knowing the host, and without knowing really what Musicasa is. So because there's a lot of price sensitivity around live entertainment and there's so many things happening, like we keep it at a, at a an accessible price, but eventually the host will will be in charge of charging of setting the price, and we're giving them a calculator where they they can calculate if I sell X amount of tickets for this amount of money, this is the actual amount of money I can make. So we we're really gonna give them the freedom to choose and and customize it on a month to month basis if that's a frequency of hosting that they want to do. So okay, you end up in Puerto Rico pandemic. Tell us how you ended up in Miami and what has been the experience kind of growing the business from Miami. Miami. I never in my wildest dreams was I going to live in Miami. Like this was a place. Were you a Miami hater? <laughs> I was. I was. And... Oh, no. <laughs> Even sweeter. It's like. <laughs> you know, I have been to Miami three times in my life, all of them either for a boat show or for my spring break. It was always party related. I was in my early 20s, like clearly different goals and objectives in my life. But also like in my mindset was I come from an island. I come from one of the most beautiful places in the world. Why would I do Miami if I can go? I can be in Puerto Rico. I'm not going to get into why not Puerto Rico anymore, but it's it was one of those things that just wasn't really like, I didn't think it had the culture. I didn't think it had the entertainment. I didn't think it had many of the things that I want in my life. So I go to Puerto Rico. I don't want to be in Puerto Rico. So I'm, I'm between LA, Austin, Mexico City, and Miami. And to me, in my mind, was like, I think the easiest one to discover if I can really live there, it's Miami because I know people there. So randomly, I get a message from this friend asking for a favor. And I remember she has family there. So I'm like, okay, do you know anyone renting a place? And she goes, my cousin is renting a place. I'm going to connect you. She had just remodeled the place. And I had a list of the things I wanted for my apartment. This apartment had everything that I had on my list. And the price was out of range. So I'm, I'm like giving her my story. Like I'm an entrepreneur. I'm taking a chance in life. Like, would you reconsider the price? And she was like, let me think about it. So a week later she calls and she's like, Bea, um, I know who you are because your mom and my sister play volleyball. Of course. <laughs> Their entire this is life. The least, this is the least surprising thing of the 35 minutes of this podcast. This is a woman from Puerto Rico that ha has had this apartment since like early 2000s. And like, I feel very comfortable that's you. And yes, I'm going to give you $200 left, um, less a month. And I'm going to pay for your security deposit so that you can actually move. So this woman ends up paying like $6,000 for me to move, to be able to move here 
It was crazy. I'm like, who is this woman and why is she my guardian angel? So I call, I go to my mom and I tell mom, like this woman, ex person um, says that she knows you. And I tell her the name and my mom goes like literally white. And she goes, Bea, she's a woman from the story. And I'm like, what story? And if you know my family, there's many stories. Many of them are famous stories because they repeat them every year. But back in the day when my brother was two years old, my mom was driving and my brother jumped out of the car because he didn't want to be in the car. So there's chaos in the middle of Ramirez Arellano and people are like running towards my mom and my brother. And the person behind my mom's car like runs, gets my brother, take them, take them to my home. And my dad ends up taking my brother to the hospital. The woman that saved my brother is a woman renting me the apartment. And my mom and her hadn't spoken for 25 years. Wow. <laughs> So when this happens, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Miami. Yeah, you have to stay. I mean, like, like, this is you a have story. to stay at that point. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Well, I've what been a in good this story. apartment. I've been in this apartment for two years, and I extended two years more. This apartment has given me more blessings and more like opportunities than I. I, I can, I'm not even gonna listen because it's like up there. But that was like the first sign. And then I get here and I think Maria, you were like the third person I met and we were in the middle of pandemic. It was Zoom. I didn't know anyone. I felt lonely. So instead of me emerging myself in the tech ecosystem, I emerged myself in the music space. So I spent my first six months of Miami connecting with all of the musicians in the space. So when I when finally things start happening from, a, from the technology sector, that things start to open up and people start to meet in person, I'm like, oh, interesting because I already have all this community of non-tech people that are in, like are using Musicasa because I launched Musicasa in Miami in September 2020 and things just started happening and I remember Laura Maidon who's a person that's very close to me and part of the Musicasa journey telling me you need to meet Laura Gonzalez you need to meet Laura Gonzalez and I'm like who is Laura Gonzalez and why is no one introducing me to her <laughs> And like in June of 2021, I'm in a party and I see Laura. So I go to her and I tell her, everyone in Miami tells me I need to meet you and that you and I have the same voice because we both have very <laughs> rapid voice. And this woman cracks up. She's like, ¿Quién carajo tú eres? Like, who are you? <laughs> so I tell her and that was, that changed everything for us because that night she said, we're investing in you. And I didn't believe her. And the next day she followed up with me. She's like, when are we meeting? I want to close the deal all against her team because her team in the venture city was like do not invest in this <laughs> like no wow. and she was like no i see it i see the vision and i think this this person this founder will figure it out it won't be easy there's going to be a lot of regulatory stuff but there's there's stuff that have already been proven that can be used as reference to build this and because of that yes my life changed and the trajectory of musicasa changed and one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges we have is that when you explain to musica when you explain musicasa people don't get it people don't understand it They're like what do you mean i'm going to have people and, and i'm going to charge people to come to my home what do you mean there's going to be a concert i just want like a band playing in the background and we're like no and it's not until people experience it that they're like oh i actually get it so it took me seven calls with Chessie and her hosting one for her to be like yeah, this is the most incredible thing that you're building. Like, what the actual fuck? We need to figure out a way to explain it in ways that people get it from the get-go and not that it takes seven calls and to experience it. And we're still there. We're still trying to figure out how to best sort of like bring it to life and really transfer that feeling that people get when they experience it. So, yes, everyone's still trying to figure it out, but you've had amazing success, right? Can you, can, you know, like, I, I'd love for us to to kind of, transition into the growth that you've seen business metrics investment you know th this is the miami tech pod there's investors on you know that, that listen to this and um people that are just generally interested in the the growth of companies and you know especially ones that are yeah. like homegrown here and can, can you can you talk about that yes absolutely so we we've done 265 musicasas um in a little bit short of two and a half years We've had more than 10,000 paying guests. Um, we've done these 265 musicasas with 54 hosts. So we have a really high retention rate of hosts that are doing this twice, three, four, five times a year, um, which was very surprising to me too. And that's, it's a 54% retention rate. 
it's extraordinary. Like we have a 65% retention rate with musicians. And one of our biggest question marks is like, okay, how do we scale this now? Like we've proven people love the experience. We've proven people are willing to pay and we've proven people want to do this from their homes. What's next? And that's really where we're going. Like this 2022 has been a year of discovery, asking questions, understanding the drivers and really testing different traction channels and modalities to understand what, what, what connects and what doesn't work. And where we are now is at that, that inflection point of like, we cannot continue doing the, the, the concerts the way that we've been doing them because it doesn't scale it's time to like actual actually launch the platform that's going to allow us to automate matching. It's going to allow us to really understand how people are using the platform so that we can retarget them through marketing campaigns. Um, and we can actually connect people with each other that creates value. It's going to allow us to drive self, self autonomy where hosts are creating their profiles and concert listings and where musicians are creating their profiles and giving us their availability. And all of that stuff is being built as we speak Version one of the product comes out Q1 of next year. We, we already have some beta, a beta platform out there where we're populating it with all of our artists and making sure that they're claiming their profiles and that they're learning how to use, how to use it and include their availability because that's the most important thing right now. Like back in the day, we would go to musicians because we give host three options of musicians for them to choose the final one. So we will be on WhatsApp talking to three different types of musicians, waiting for them to respond if they're available or not. That's not sustainable. Imagine right. what we're doing like 17 musicasas a month, like multiply that by three each, right? So we've created a, a backend office, if you will, where it really sort of like, like it semi-automates all of that. Um, and we have an artist library where Jose are going to be able to see the 300 plus artists that we have. And that's sort of, that's going to be the foundation of what we're building. Um, there's going to be identity verification. There's going to be in-app payment and in-app messaging. Uh, we have a very robust uh, pipeline roadmap that we have in the next year. So where I'm at, where I am right now is that I'm raising a pre-seed extension of my last round to really hone in in three things, getting the right people. So I'm hiring now a CPO, I'm hiring an operations manager and two senior full stack developers. And then uh, we, we want to like double, double down on the product. And two, getting to, to product market fit within the South Florida and Puerto Rico ecosystem so that we can replay that playbook in the two major cities that we're going to open next year. Um, and next year, our goal is to do two musicasas a day, which in, like, in turn, it's like 670 concerts for the entire year. Right? So, that that reminds <laughs> that story, the when you were talking about kind of, yeah, what's happening with artists, it reminded me of a few years ago, we had Mary Biggins, one of the co-founders of ClassPass, uh, give mm. a talk at Refresh. And she was saying, yeah, very early days, they would be like, oh, here's a, you know, Barry's boot camp class and people would book it. They would then call Barry's and be like, I want to book it. Like it was all manual. Like they didn't have any inventory of Barry's. They just were booking it themselves on the back end. Absolutely. And it's like, it's crazy. I, I, from the 265 musicasas, I, I've been to 250. Um, and I just, it is, it has been the greatest research. Uh, like last night, we, I was at a musicasa at Michelle Apps, which is also part of the Miami Tech community. And out of that concert, it was a 20 person concert. Six people came and signed up as hosts. That's 30% of the entire, of the entire like community that attended. Um, and, th and that continues to be one of our number one lead generation and acquisition channels for us because people are in the feeling and they're like, oh my God, I want to do this in my home. And I didn't know it was this easy. But yeah, a lot of the things have been that manual. There will be things next year that will continue to be manual as we learn. But I'm just, I'm just ready for this platform to be out there. <laughs> I'm ready to see and showcase that this is not as difficult and to scale as people think it is um, just because of the nature of how, how simple the matchmaking is. And really a lot, like when you give people guidelines, they follow the guidelines and that's, that's how we want to approach it. Very community driven and very do it yourselfer and keep the cost, the cost low so that it makes sense for everyone to participate. This um, has been incredible. Bea. You talked about fundraising and I want to close with a thought. Okay, yeah. so Let's do that. I, last year, so I was raising a pre-seat run of 400,000 
last year and I ended up raising $810,000. And part of it was the Venture City. I raised from Adriana Cisneros and Alan Faena and I raised from Warner Music Group and Concord and we got into Texter's music. So like it's really been this incredible pipeline of people that are now allies that are extremely strategic because we have people in the entertainment and music sector, in the real estate and culture sector. And then we have other angel investors that are much, are much more into product development and have done this before and are, are also founders. So in this pre-seed extension raise that I'm doing now, I'm doing a 1.5 million round. We already have 500,000 in commitments. I'm closing by December 15. Um, so if there's any investors with, that are listening to us that you're interesting, interested in learning more, um, hit me up and we'll get to talking. Yeah, this is the plug part. So email <laughs> investors, email Bea, is it Beatriz at Musicasa? Or? Beatriz Ayala at Musicasa with an extra we'll, at the end, dot com. We'll also tag her Twitter and the show notes <laughs> and everything. So check, keep an eye on your DMs. Um, but also for folks that want to become hosts or artists that are, you know, maybe we have some artists in our listeners. Uh, how should they, did they just go to the site and kind of fill out a form? Yes. So they will go to musicasalive.com and within that platform, artists will be able to sign up uh, and get onboarded. And then the same thing with hosts. Um, once you're onboarded, you, you do a full registration and the magic begins. This month um, we're having 15 musicasas and then next month, right, right now we are at 15. Um, we're anticipating that we're going to close between 20 to 25 Musicasas next month. So if you want to attend, just go to musicasalive.com. And there's also the range of concerts that are happening throughout Miami and Puerto Rico. Yeah. Wow. We, we could do this for another hour. I have so many questions, but like, <laughs> we, we got to wrap. This, is, this has been an incredible podcast. I'm like yeah. uh, super pumped about your success and where this is going. I know it's going to be huge eventually you'll be able to book Beyonce at your home. I know it. 100%. Exactly. Uh, I think but, Caesar's jealous. He's not related to you, but it's okay. Yeah. Well, no, well, my, no. my mother was born in San Juan. So maybe, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, so far. like we can, we can continue this conversation over wine. I know that you love your wine. So Let's we can do definitely do a wine tasting and do that. And I'm also, I'm also going to do so, a shameless thing. And um, I would love from the Miami tech community that I haven't met that I would love to meet because I think that there's a lot of parallelisms within our business is Andrew Parker from Papa. So if anyone can connect me with him, I would, I would be happy to. Him. He's okay. He's actually <laughs> coming on the podcast in two weeks. So go. we're going to tell him. <laughs> we'll, we'll let him know. We'll let him know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so awesome. much. This has been an awesome episode. Um, we will have you back on the podcast a hundred percent for sure. I mean, I this, is, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for having me. Have a happy Friday and enjoy your weekend. Bye.